Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We are just giving it one more minute and we'll start very soon, but feel free to introduce yourself in the chat as you come in for everyone to get to know you. Okay, we'll begin. Again, good morning, good afternoon, everyone who has joined us. Um, this is the launch of the Unprotected Report and we welcome all of you from wherever you're joining. Before we get started, I want to share some housekeeping information. Um, I want to make sure that you're all aware that the interpretation is available in French, Spanish, and Arabic. Um, to join the interpretation, you will have to click on the globe icon that is in the Zoom panel on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Uh, you may also need to click the, the three dots that show that says more to find that interpretation option. We invite you to introduce yourself um, in the chat, but also use the Q&A function. You will find the Q&A function in, at the bottom uh, banner um, to ask real-time questions. We promise that we will um, respond to your questions either during the webinar or afterwards. My name is Hani Mansurian, and I'm the director of the Alliance for Child Protection in Humanitarian Action. I think we can comf comfortably say that the current humanitarian situation is unprecedented. By the end of 2023, 363 million people required humanitarian assistance. Increasing armed conflict, record levels of forced displacement, climate change, um, and, and the emergencies that are induced by climate change, and the disasters that are associated by natural and hazards pushed humanitarian funding requirements at the end of 2023 to $56.7 billion. While children are the most vulnerable to harm in the face of humanitarian crises, they are also bear the brunt of its impact. Approximately 400 million children, or one in every five child globally, live in or are fleeing from conflict-stricken areas. 47 million children globally have been forcibly displaced. One billion children are living in countries that are at an extremely high risk of impact from global change. Now, 2023 saw the eruption of conflict in Sudan, which triggered the world's, uh, the world's largest child displacement crisis, the outbreak of conflict in Gaza, the deadliest conflict for children in recent times, continuing drought across the Horn of Africa, where food insecurity has led to increased school dropouts, child marriage, and female gen genital mutilation, flooding in Libya, which threatened children's health and protection. Despite historically high levels of funding, the funding rate for UN coordinated appeals was only 43%, uh, a record low. This is the back backdrop of today's discussion. The unprotected report that we are launching today is the fifth in a series of reports produced by the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, Save the Children, UNHCR, and the CPAOR. The series was first published in 2019 and has tracked reported humanitarian funding to child protection since the year 2010. The Unprotected series has been a critical tool for driving accountability and supporting advocacy efforts by and for the humanitarian child protection community. The objectives of our sessions are primarily to share the key findings of, of, the, of this year's report and to encourage you to delve into the report further and use it for your own advocacy purposes. Also to share about what can be done to protect children when child protection programming is relatively well-funded, while also highlighting the implications of underfunding for children and their protection. Now I'll just quickly go through, and just to say that the report itself is ready. It's going to be shared with you in the chat at, towards the end of this session. So if you haven't seen it, it's okay because nobody outside of the, these groups that have produced it have seen it. So just the agenda of, uh, of today quickly. After the introduction, we will hear uh, from Amel uh, and Ron on the findings of the report. Then we will have um, a panel discussion with Celestine and Rangini. Then we'll have some time for Q&A, but please put your questions already in the chat as you listen to the speakers. And then uh, Catherine will come to uh, give us a reflection from a donor's perspective. And lastly, but not least, 
we'll have closing remarks from Steve Miller from uh, Save the Children. With that, I would like to hand over to Amel Amir Ali, who is the Protection Officer, the Division of International Protection at UNHCR HQ. And Amel will then hand over to Ron Powells, uh, who is the Coordinator of Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility. Without further ado, Amel, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hani. Welcome, everyone. So just to give you a bit of a global overview um, on the uh, findings of the report, but also uh, maybe zooming in on the RP situation in particular. I mean, as you probably know, both refugee response plans and humanitarian response plans are strategic and planning and fundraising tools uh, for overall refugee and humanitarian situations, respectively. And they are the tools that lay out the intended interagency action plan and the financial requirements to achieve the results collectively. So an analysis of, of these tools for 2023 revealed that first that child protection needs and funding requirements continue to raise in 2023, but this doesn't come as a surprise to anyone, uh, as Henny was mentioning all the uh, difficult situations uh, that um, were happening across the world. Uh, with a total uh, for child protection requirements across all UN coordinated appeals reaching $1.5 billion. Um, a total of five, uh, $505 million in humanitarian and child protection funding was reported in 2023, including $412 million within the UN coordinated appeal. Um, as in previous years, this analysis also revealed that critical underfunding of child protection persists uh, in both uh, these uh, documents that we were mentioning, the HRP and RRPs, and overall they were less than a third of the child protection funding requirements that were met. However, uh, it's important to highlight that data also showed that there are wide disparities in child protection funding rates between different responses and there is a fluctuation over time. Uh, for instance, in 2023, we could see that 40% of the child protection funding in the HRP context in 2023 went to three responses, uh, including Syria with $48 million, Ukraine with $46 million, and Yemen with $25 million. Of course, there have been welcome improvements in reporting visibility of the child protection funding uh, on both uh, the OCHA managed financial tracking service that helps us actually having these numbers and do this analysis and UNHR managed refugee funding tracker. But, so we could see, for instance, that between 2022 and 2023, the FTS showed significant increases in funding reported for child protection and our analysis suggests that improved reporting has been a, a, a real significant driver, influenced in part by welcome improvement to the FTS itself. Uh, of course, these improvements give us a lot of visibility of funding going to child protection as a component of a multi-sector program, in addition uh, to standalone CP projects. There were also recent improvements to the refugee funding tracker where disaggregation of data um, where you know the child protection uh, information on, on, on funding was separated from the overall protection uh, that made information available on the child protection funding in refugee context than was the case in previous years. Of course, these improvements are welcome and are crucial for transparency and better resource allocation, particularly for child protection. Um, now, just zooming in and looking specifically at refugee context, one thing about the refugee context is that the overall response to refugees are funded at a lower rate than the HRP. So on average, less than a third of the overall funding requirements for RPs are met, meaning that child protection is on average and the funding to a similar degree as RPs overall. Um, the least funded plans for child protection across humanitarian and refugee context uh, in percentage terms were found among RP context. So there is, an, you know, less funds go into refugee responses and, and child protection is uh, equally impacted by that. Uh, we can find also disparities across the RPs, uh, just uh, the way that are in the HRPs. There are, for instance, three plans where around 50% uh, funded for child protection, including Bangladesh with 52%, Pakistan with 50%, and Jordan 49%. And then in five of the 18 refugee plans that we analyzed, child protection requirements were less than 10% funded for 
for instance, South Sudan with only 2%, Ethiopia with 4% uh, in, the, in the regional RP for Sudan, and Kenya in, in South Sudan uh, RP for 6%, and then Sudan 9% in the South Sudanese response. Uh, looking ahead to 2024, in refugee context with available data, there has been an overall increase in CP funding requirements. And of course, understanding that this completely differs from the HRP context um, that respond to basically humanitarian uh, situations. And, and you know, this is what we call uh, the, the cluster system. Um, so yeah, and now hand over to Ron to speak more specifically about the HRP context and, and other key findings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amel. And good morning, afternoon or evening, everyone. So I will talk a bit about the an overview of the humanitarian response plan and also briefly look ahead to 2024. So in the in HRP settings, uh, child protection is disproportionately underfunded compared to the overall response plans. So in 2023, HRP's requirements overall were funded at an average rate of 47%. However, child protection requirements in HRP were only 29% funded. While the best funded plans for child protection in percentage terms were found among the HRP context uh, compared to the RRP context, in only six of the 26 HRPs were child protection requirements more than 50% funded, such as in Guatemala, OPT, Myanmar, Central African Republic, Yemen, and, and Syria. Among the HRPs, child protection funding rates were lowest in Mali, 6%, and Burkina Faso, 7%. In some HRP contexts, child protection has become better funded over time. So that's good news, such as in Syria, South Sudan, and Chad. In other contexts, funding coverage has really fluctuated such as in Yemen, OPT, uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, and Afghanistan. This affects really the ability of child protection actors to implement consistent and quality programming, which will be further explored in the, in the panel later on. So if you would like to see the full breakdown of funding coverage across the HRPs and RRPs, we highly encourage you to read the report, which will be shared with you later. Data in the report also highlights the donors uh, funding child protection. Improved reporting of child protection funding within multi-sectoral programs means that this year's report highlights the contribution of a wider range of donors than in previous years and allows recognition of child protection donors as part of multi-sector programs. The report also presents available data on recipients of humanitarian child protection funding. Only 2% tracked funding went directly to local and national organizations. Limited visibility beyond first-tier recipients means that indirect funding to local actors remains challenging to track. So it may be that the 2% is, is, uh, is a very low percentage and lower than, than the reality. Um, but uh, this is what we found with, uh, when we did the research for this, uh, for this unprotected report. So this report also includes a looking ahead to 2024 section, which looks at funding requirements across HRPs and RRPs. Unlike in RRP context, where across the board child protection funding requirements have increased by 4% from 2023, in HRP context, overall child protection funding requirements decreased in 2024. And a majority of HRPs have been reduced, have seen reduced child protection funding requirements. As many of you know, in 2024, the humanitarian sector has been forced to sharpen its focus to prioritize better and cut overall funding requirements in a constrained funding environment. It is important to recognize that the wider humanitarian funding context is extremely concerning for children. Protection of children and their rights is a responsibility shared by the humanitarian system and requires all humanitarian sectors to be sufficiently funded in order to play their critical role in keeping children safe. We are concerned that overall reductions in humanitarian funding will negatively impact children and their protection. Thank you. I'll now hand back to, uh, to Hani. 
Great. Thank you, both of you, uh, for the great overview of the key findings. It's uh, very interesting, lots of very um, interesting uh, points that you made, some of which I noted the disparity element that both Amel and Ron, you mentioned across the ROPs and HRPs, we see this huge disparity, uh, which then in many cases, also looking at the previous reports leads to unpredictability of, of funding uh, for, for many of the, of the responses. Um, you all both also mentioned the improvement in, in the reporting, um, which is both across the refugee and uh, ROP and, and uh, HRP context, which is very welcome. Um, but also the space, the, the, the kind of the space that remains in terms of improvement, especially, for example, in funding, in tracking funding to local organizations. Um, and, uh, and also a very welcome news that more donors, uh, a wider range of donors have, are, are being seen as contributing to, to child protection now. So I will be now handing over to, to Elspeth, who is going to moderate a panel for us on two specific uh, uh, contexts that will show you uh, two different realities in terms of funding for child protection. Elspeth, over to you. Thank you very much, Hani. My name is Elspeth from the Alliance team. I'm one of the co-authors of the report and it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. So as we've heard loud and clear from uh, Ron and Amel, um, funding disparities across crises are having a serious impact on child protection efforts. The gaps are a harsh reality and they're really affecting the ability of coordination bodies and frontline actors to deliver the consistent quality services that children urgently need. So today we're privileged to have two experts with us to dive into this issue. And I'd like to welcome Celestine Asu, Child Protection Officer with UNHCR in Chad, and Ranjini Pascarazingham, the Coordinator for the Child Respect Protection Area of Responsibility in Ukraine. So uh, Celestine and Ranjini are going to share with us um, some of their experience and shed light on what this um, inconsistent um, funding situation means for their responses and for the children, families and communities they serve. So let's start with Celestine, um, who's currently coordinating child protection efforts in Chad's Sudan refugee response. It's a crisis with soaring needs, but unfortunately, as we're going to hear, the funding is falling far short. So Celestine, um, in a nutshell, can you please give us a very quick overview of the specific situation of refugee refugee children from Sudan in Chad. Thank you, Elspeth, uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, Sudanese uh, refugee population represent uh, uh, almost 86% uh, of the 1.2 million uh, refugees in Chad. Children representing 65% uh, of the Sudanese refugees population. While in uh, Adri, which is one of the main entry points, we have 72% of children. RRP uh, partners also identify more than uh, 33,000 uh, uh, children at risk with high rates of separation. Uh, child marriage, sexual violence, exploitation and abuse, child labor and trafficking. Those child protection risks are compounded by difficult living conditions, challenging protection environment, climate hazards, and lack of access to basic needs and child protection specialized services. Thank you so much, um, Celestine. So actually, um, from the findings that Amel just shared, um, and which we, you can all read um, in the report, we can see that in 2023, Chad received um, just over 600,000 um, USD for this entire response, uh, which is about 14% of the ask. Um, so as a coordinator, Chad, 
Can you tell us how this current funding situation is impacting child protection services and what you are seeing in your day-to-day -day work? Thank you. You know, uh, having been uh, an humanitarian worker for uh, more than 20 years, including in conflict zone and uh, having among the first respondent to this crisis, I have never witnessed uh, anything as heartbreaking as the situation of Sudanese refugee children in Chad's. The sheer scale of trauma uh, and suffering is overwhelming. Uh, young children, um, particularly girls, uh, bearing the scar of sexual violence, struggling with the weight of witnessing uh, atrocities, including murdering of their families, members, and uh, countless uh, unaccompanied children left utterly uh, alone and vulnerable. And vulnerable. Uh, more than a year later, nothing has really changed, I can tell you. Uh, could you imagine that uh, with this profile, uh, MHPSS uh, service, mental health and psychosocial support services are almost non-existent. The few child protection, uh, child-friendly spaces that exist, I can say one child-friendly spaces for almost 25,000 uh, children are dilapidated and unsafe for children. In terms of child protection response as well, we have one case worker for every 300 cases of children at risk, not to mention the limited availability of overall response service, such as health service, legal, uh, and uh, mental health and psychosocial support as well. Nutrition, I can add. Thank you, Celestine, for sharing this really bleak situation whereby we have the standards, we have the tools, we have the solutions, but without the funding, we're barely even to getting close to the minimum standards required to really protect these children. Um, and, I, and we know, and this is also a focus of the report, that yes, it has a focus on child protection funding, but it also looks at the bigger picture. So when there are short, when there are, um, when we lack funding across the entire humanitarian and refugee response, including in other sect sectors, this also has a detrimental impact on children and their protection. So can you tell me um, from your experience in Chad how this lack of funding across other sectors um, is also impacting child protection outcomes for these Sudan refugee children? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's important to, to note that the funding situation of the overall uh, response, not only uh, child protection, has a devastating impact on children. Uh, for me, it's like a vicious circle, lack of access to services such as education, nutrition, and livelihood increase child protection risk. Uh, child protection services are limited, and if available, there are few response services uh, to refer to. And also, uh, when those services exist, uh, resources are too scarce to ensure they are up to standard uh, and fully mainstream child protection and, and thus contribute to child protection outcome. I give you an example. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, I was in a camp in the eastern part, a new, a new camp in the eastern part of, uh, of Chad, uh, where uh, discussing with population, they mentioned and we witnessed that uh, four schools have no water facilities and uh, also, uh, uh, um, also toilets. So this leads to a uh, school drop of uh, children uh, going to home to, to, to take water and not coming again. So in addition to limited space in, uh, in school, we have uh, a 40% uh, uh, 40 of enrollment 
out of 75% uh, uh, of uh, school age uh, children. Uh, there are no wash facilities, and this is one of the main contributing factor to school drop, as I mentioned, particularly for girls, uh, uh, given uh, the, the consideration of uh, menstrual hygiene uh, issues, and which is drastic, drastically increase uh, the risk of child marriage as well for girls. To close, uh, I, I want to share with you some real picture from uh, Sudanese refugee camp in Chad. Uh, those are taken in Chad-friendly spaces, and I think they speak for themselves. So uh, you can see um, uh, uh, Chad-friendly spaces under trees, a lack of materials, uh, leading to children themselves uh, trying to create their space. You, we see the small girls and also adolescents having their, uh, their activities uh, out of door. The, small in, uh, in the few infrastructure existing uh, are out of, uh, are insecure, as I mentioned, and as we, we could see in uh, the picture. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Celestine. I think it's so important that we remember behind these figures that we see in the report that is having a real impact. And in this case, very negatively on those refugee children in, in Chad. So thank you ever so much for, for shedding a light on the harsh realities that they face. Um, it's not all bad news. Um, and I'm now going to turn to uh, Rangini who's uh, leading the child protection area of responsibility in Ukraine to hear her perspective. Um, so in the report, um, our 2023 data um, from, the, from the FTS shows that the Ukraine child protection um, HNRP was funded at $46 million, uh, which is still underfunded, but it's creeping closer to 30%. Um, so it's one of the comparatively uh, better funded. Um, so could you comment, um, Rangini, on what impact this level of funding has had on the ability of child protection actors to provide critical services to children uh, and their families? Thanks, Elizabeth. Hope you hear me okay. Yeah, I mean, child petition, um, the Ukraine child petition HNRP was funded at uh, USD 46 million um, in 23. Um, it is considerably um, uh, um, amount compared to the, um, you know, uh, uh, global context, but it's far from the reality and which was requested 146 million for the humanitarian response. Um, this substantial gap um, highlights the continued need uh, for increased investment to meet the growing and urgent child petition needs in Ukraine. Despite all the funding challenges um, reaching the frontline communities, the child petition partners made a significant progress in delivering the child petition, critical child petition services. These services include MHPSS, which is mental health and psychosocial support, legal assistance, case management, family tracing and reunification, family support, um, uh, family-based care, and case assistance for child petition outcome. The establishment of comprehensive child petition strategy alongside the coordination with over 200 um, partners in Ukraine uh, with 700 mobile team, has enabled for the child petition actors to deliver the timely and effective interventions across Ukraine. Over 1 million caregivers were supported with critical knowledge and tools to protect their children. An effective uh, child petition data information management system, including a very full functional uh, child petition dashboard, was de developed to improve the child petition and child, uh, child petition case management and referral tracking. 
the scaling up, up of the child petition information management system, which includes over 70 um, partners and uh, 500 users, has significantly improved the services and enhancing the service delivery. Uh, the child petition award has made significant improvement and in order to achieve the um, um, regional level and subnational level coordination closely working with the uh, local authorities and local partners especially in the front line of last and the community the collaboration mm -hmm. with local authorities and service providers has strengthened the localized response to ensure the comprehensive support for the vulnerable children the progress achieved with the limited funding demonstrate the potential for even greater outcome with more substantial investment. Increased funding would allow our petition partners to address the critical gaps, especially to improve the reach and the quality services in the frontline um, communities. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Manjini. It's it's incredible to hear in comparison to the previous uh context what can really be done when there are better levels of funding um, available both going directly to those implementing programs but also the level of support that the cpaor is actually able to provide if there are resources in place um, and i actually want to zoom in on one on one element you mentioned you mentioned um advances in localized responses and um, this is also a core focus of our report and a call to better track and to better allocate direct funding to uh, local organizations. Um, so could you tell us a bit more about how the funding that the CPAOR has received for coordination um, has directly impacted the local and uh, national organizations that you're working with? Absolutely. I mean, the Child Petition AOR continuously prioritizing the localization efforts in child petition mm -hmm. in Ukraine. So we have taken a several measures to ensure the local partners participation in our in a meaningful participation in coordination meetings, which includes we pro provide translation and uh, with the local actors and also translating all the documents and all the training materials and all delivered in local language which allow them to be comfortably participating in, in, in our coordination mechanism, but also not just only at the national level, but also subnational level that has been enhanced. But also the child petition information management system has been also translated into Ukrainian, including the tools and, and protocols. So it is easier for the local partners to really able to use those guidance and material to deliver the quality uh, child petition services. Additionally, we have also worked on the um, resource mobilization help desk within child petition AOR. We created that help desk to support the national partners to gain more resources, which means that we provide more of uh, technical support to review their project proposals and before the submissions. So through that mechanism, they were able to uh, adequately gain more more funding from even the uh, local UHF funding. So we kind of allow the, the child petition partners to not only like, you know, providing the technical um, support, but also uh, helping them to, to, to access more resources through this help desk, which made, made it more of a localized uh, child petition response in, in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I encourage those to actually read the reports because this case study is actually documented um, in 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 the in the in the in this year's report, um, and it's really interesting to hear this model of a resource mobilization help desk as well um, at at country level. Um, so thank you ever so much, uh, Ranjini, for highlighting these critical localization efforts. Um, it's really encouraging to see. Um, anyway, so just before we close the panel, um, it would be great if we could just have you both back. Um, to share maybe one final recommendation, call to action um, that you would like to share um, with the participants today. So um, over to you, Celestine. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, 
the crisis uh, demands urgent action. This is what I can say. We are failing uh, an entire generation of children, uh, robbing uh, them of their childhoods and their futures. The world must not uh, uh, look away from this tragedy uh, and uh, unfolding before our eyes. So we need to act urgently uh, to, 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 to have, to, to support uh, Sudanese uh, children in the uh, operation here in Chad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Celestine. Indeed, a powerful call to action. The report, um, it shows this massive inequality of funding across responses and our role now as advocates in this child protection and humanitarian space is to try to do everything we can to ensure that there is a more equitable distribution of resources across the uh, different responses. Thank you ever so much, Celestine. Rangini, over to you, please. Yeah, I mean, the positive outcome in child protection and humanitarian action made possibly available and it is effectively done because of the effective coordination and the information management that has been established. So this coordination mechanism is really provide as an effective tool to deliver the um, um, child protection services to the population and children in need. So in my experience, I strongly um, uh, believe that, you know, the need, there's a need to continue invest in, in, in coordination mechanisms. So that can play a role um, to provide um, more for gap analysis, making sure that the actual the needed population and children are getting the adequate services as they need. So to invest in coordination and uh, information management is really essential as well. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you ever so much, Ranjini, and a big thank you to you both for both of our panelists, panelists here today for your candid and insightful contributions. Um, whilst, of course, the resources and the research and the reports are invaluable, nothing can really match the impact of hearing your first-hand accounts. So thank you ever so much, and I'm now going to hand the floor back to Hani. Great. Thank you so much, um, Elspeth. Celestine and Rangini for really great insights into these two very uh, different contexts. And it's uh, encouraging to hear Rangini how effective coordination and some level of decent funding, what it can achieve. Um, and Celestine, we, we will all uh, um, promise that we will, in whatever capacity that we have, that we'll continue advocating for uh, more funding for for um, the Sudan crisis, which is a hugely important child protection crisis. Um, and thank you both of you for the work that that you're doing. With that, I'm going to be handing over to Alison Wright, who is alongside with Elspeth, another very critical person in authorship of the report. Uh, Alison is the global head of child protection policy and advocacy for uh, for Save the Children. And Alison will uh, moderate a Q&A for us. Alison, over to you. Thanks, Hani. And thanks to uh, all the speakers and panelists so far for your uh, insights and reflections. Um, as, as Elspeth and others have said, it's, it's really, it's, it's great to look behind the numbers. And as one of the authors of the report, I've spent a lot of time looking at the numbers, but actually to, to hear the, the stories and the reality behind those numbers is, is actually what we're, um, what we're here to do. So I've been trying to follow the uh, the questions in the chat. I'm going to pull a few. I'm conscious that um, the uh, Elspeth and the panelists won't have had a time, won't have had the chance yet to kind of look at and think about the questions which have been posted. So I'll try to pick some ones which maybe are, are a little little more straightforward uh, and maybe direct them to the uh, the speakers in the first half of the program, um, if you can take some of those. I can also take um, a couple about the, the more sort of methodology, what the report does and doesn't do. Of course, we would urge you to dig into the report as soon as you get it um, in your inboxes. Um, but but then if, uh, if panelists, and I know that some, uh, some of the panelists and speakers are already trying to type answers, which is great, um, but I will try to urge you to, to take the floor for some of the uh, the answers. Um, so we had an, we had a question quite um, early at the um, at the top of the session around uh, funding, whether there was any sort of analysis or reflections on funding and the ability of child protection actors to report results. 
Um, we don't have any analysis on that specifically within the reports, but I'm wondering if any of the uh, the speakers on this session could reflect on that a little bit. So the question, the question, just to recap, was: Do you see potential linkages between funding and the sector's ability to report on results for children? I'm just pausing there to see if anyone would like to take that question. I don't want to uh, to pick on anyone. Okay. All right. Maybe we'll come back to that one if no one's going to. Uh, no one's going to take it. Or oh, Hannah, you came off. You came off mute there. Do you want to? I mean, in, in the absence reflection? of any other volunteers, I'll just reflect on it. Just having worked in the in the data realm in in my previous positions, um, it's very interesting. I mean, uh, this is not news to almost any of you who have worked in humanitarian um, context, but data and reporting monitoring and evaluation are often seen as kind of the good to have and not the, the must have. So oftentimes when when we are all pressed for, for funding, the funding goes to, to what is um, considered as the absolute must and then and what the absolute necessary elements of, of our programming uh, and collecting data, reporting on, on our work kind of starts falling falling off the radar very quickly. So I think there's a direct link between us having a decent amount of, uh, of funding for, for our programs and how we actually end up reporting on our, uh, being able to and dedicating the time to report on, on programs and outcomes. Great, thanks, honey. Um, just pausing to see if any of the other speakers would like to add to that. Or if not, there's a few questions about the content of the report, which I won't go into too much because um, you will all, of course, be uh, delving into the report immediately after this session. But just to take a few of those while uh, while other speakers and panelists are reviewing the question. So there was a question about do we explore the uh, some of the reasons for the disparities between uh, funding for different response plans, um, which came through very clearly in the in the findings that uh, that Ron Namel presented. Um, we don't explicitly dig into those reasons. I think we could speculate, and I and I see that the um, the the questioner proposed some um, potential reasons for that, but we we haven't done that analysis. Um, I think there is there is analysis elsewhere as to why uh, some responses are are better funded than others, but but that wasn't something we specifically looked at. Um, there was also a question on. Um, the donors, uh, whether we are, uh, what the the the, uh, the data that's presented on uh, donors, and one thing that we were able to do this year, which I think one of the uh, the speakers at the top presented talked about, was how we've got better visibility this year on the funding going to child protection, and that is because um, the the FTS, which is uh, the main one of the two sources of data that we uh, we use for this, um, have quite significantly improved the um, the reporting and the way that the what, what was termed the granularity of data so that we can see in much more detail where funding is going, who funding is coming from, and including funding going to um, child protection as part of multi-sector programs. So what that allows us to do is to see and get visibility on a much wider range of donors. So comparing the list of donors that we see in the report this year to previous reports, it, we've actually got a much uh, longer list of, of donors who are supporting child protection, perhaps as part of um, multi-sector programs, which is great to see. And I, I'd encourage you to have a look at that. Um, okay, a couple of other questions which are specific to um, to panelists. So I'm going to go to Ranjini because there was a specific question for you, which I, I, I'm reading a slightly different to the question you answered during the panel about um, funding to local uh, child protection partners. There's a question for you in the chat about um, collaboration between the CPAOR and um, the child protection authorities in Ukraine, and whether you could reflect a little bit about the success factors for that collaboration. Uh, um, I mean, yes, we do have a very uh, close collaboration uh, with the 
local authorities, particularly because you know Ukraine has a very dynamic kind of a situation where we have a national um, coordination system. We do have a subnational and regional level coordination um, system. So the regional coordination system, we are the regional authorities or so blast authorities and um, service for children affairs are the closed entities to kind of work on, on the children issues. So we do have a very close collaboration and they do participate actively in, in, in child petition award meetings at the regional level. And we do have also collaboration with Ministry of Social Policy at the national level and to also kind of uh, outline our priorities and, and, and also, you know, to understand uh, the policy framework and what, what uh, the social service department can able to do it. I didn't also mention one of the initiatives that we have very strong um, the referral mechanisms where we have a humanitarian service providers as well as the um, the state social service providers are also incorporated into one referral mechanism. So then it is easier for the case uh, case workers or social workers or child petition partners able to refer the social service department, vice versa, they can also refer to, to the uh, humanitarian actors. So that's really kind of built as a joint platform in order to, to en enhance this uh, collaboration and coordination uh, with the government um, authorities and entities. So of course, this is still need to continue. There's a uh, lots of uh, area for improvement and, and moving forward because we're also looking at more of a longer term and transition and so on. We really need the government engagement. So the, the collaboration is still continue. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Rangini. Okay, I'm just going to turn back to the, the list of questions. Um, there's a couple of oh, this, just a, quite a long one come in that I, I haven't had the opportunity to um, to read and digest, but there are a couple I've noticed um, of questions related to um, child protection and other sectors. Um, and the uh, one which I have slightly lost track of now, which was, um, I think, around working with and um, advocating to and with other sectors to integrate child protection. And that certainly is um, a, a huge focus of the Alliance and of our advocacy efforts is around uh, the centrality of children and their protection across sectors, working across sectors. Um, so definitely, we were obviously looking in the analysis for this report specifically at the child protection funding, but we're very much taking, and I think the recommendations, when you review those, you'll see that the recommendations are taking a much broader, uh, uh, sort of adopting a much broader lens across um, across sectors. And we recognise that um, that integrating child protection um, within other sectors is, is absolutely critical. Um, and sort of on a similar vein, there was also a question around how can we, uh, again, I've, I've lost it, I'm sorry, the chat is moving. Um, how can we um, look at look to different sectors, um, sort of comparison of funding levels across sectors? Can we learn from sectors which have been more successful in, um, in increasing funding or have higher levels of funding? Um, that isn't something that we do in Unprotected. And I think that, with, again, we're trying to take the sort of broader view of uh, the, the humanitarian funding environment overall for children, rather than necessarily sort of um, looking at comparisons between sectors, but um, but I, I, I take your point. Um, I'm going to just pause there and just check with uh, with Hani whether we need to go I think we probably do need to to move on I know that there are a number of questions in the uh, in the Q&A which haven't been addressed directly I will try to pick up on a few of those uh, during the final section um, but if there's still any other feedback you have I see some suggestions from uh, from people for things that we could look at further then then please do reach out we'll give you contact details at the end of this session uh, and we'd love to hear from you and look forward to collaborating further. So I will hand back to Hannah. Great. Thank you very much, Alison, and everyone else who contributed. Uh, and yes, we will do our best to answer all the questions. And uh, I encourage all the panelists to look at the questions uh, and try to respond. Uh, just to highlight this element of multi-sectoral, um, tracking multi-sectoral funds linked to child protection, but also what Celestine said, which is the importance of, um, of also understanding the impact of other sectors losing their funding on how children are going to be protected and the risks that it puts children at. So with that, I'm going to invite Katrina Anderson 
from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway. She's the policy director and special representative for protection of civilians to give us a reflection on the issue of funding for child protection from a donor's perspective. Katerina. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, good afternoon to all. And thank you for inviting me to speak at this important uh, launch. Um, we are very happy to receive this report because it gives us important knowledge about uh, how um, child protection is funded, the dynamics uh, in the humanitarian sector in terms of prioritizing child protection, how it is uh, part of the program cycle and all of the, um, all of the processes that you as humanitarian workers know very well. From our side, uh, from Norway's side, we will continue to uh, prioritize child protection, both in our humanitarian policies and in our humanitarian funding. Uh, of course, for us, when we see that the needs are completely outpacing the funding, uh, we have to ask ourselves some questions. Um, first of all, we have to look at the sector itself, how it works, how it prioritizes child protection or not, when resources are scarce. If we look at vulnerability, if we look at needs, it seems obvious to us that children should be at the center of a protection response, a humanitarian uh, protection response, and we need to understand better how we can make that happen. Secondly, in terms of the suffering and the, the wounds inflicted on children, we as states and uh, with all the humanitarian partners, we need to look at how we can prevent uh, more of the suffering uh, that children are exposed to. Uh, it's not only a matter of, of uh, increasing the funding, better quality funding, improving the quality of, of the humanitarian response, but we also really need to look at what can we do together to better prevent the suffering that children are exposed to. We look uh, at the conduct of hostilities by parties to conflict in many areas today. And they really are the cause and the creation of soaring needs, of suffering and violations that really has long-term consequences uh, for children, for their families, for their communities, the places where they live, the places where they play, the places where they learn are attacked and destroyed and not rebuilt. So this has really an impact across generations and, and in terms of peace building in terms of the prospects for development, the prospects for reaching our common uh, sustainable development goals. The lack of protection for children today is, is really having an impact long term. And this, of course, affects all of us. Um, and we need to look at how we can work better to, to prevent violations, to change the conduct uh, of certain parties to conflict and use the instruments that we have, that so many of you have been engaged in, in uh, creating and promoting. I'm speaking about the Geneva Conventions, I'm speaking about the Safe Schools Declaration, about the EVIPA Political Declaration. These are our tools to try to protect children better in addition to, uh, to providing uh, funding and resources to uh, a strong child protection humanitarian response. I think I'll stop there, Annie. I see time is running fast. Perfect. Thank you very much, Catherine, um, and for your continued support as, as a, a government for child protection, but particularly for this report. If, if it was not for the Norwegian government and the support that they provided to Save the Children and the Alliance, this report would not have happened. So really appreciate it. And this has been going on for a few years. So with that, I'm just going to turn to uh, another critical uh, supporter for this, for this report. From the beginning, from 2019, Save the Children has been uh, a leader in making sure that this report happens. Uh, so we'll hear the closing remarks from Steve Miller, who is the Global Child Protection Director for Save the Children. Over to you, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Hani. And thanks, Catherine and Ranjini and Celestine, Amal and Ron, such insightful analysis, powerful messaging. Thank you. So what, what have we heard? Three things. 
Despite what looks like an increase in funding, child protection only receives about a third of what we request. HRPs, disproportionately underfunded. RRPs, more like the wider response, but at a lower rate overall. We've seen that there are huge disparities in funding across responses. And the bottom line is that this is affecting our ability to prevent and respond to violence against children in humanitarian contexts. So this report has recommendations underlining the importance of prioritizing child protection in humanitarian action by integrating it into all planning, advocacy, and resource mobilization efforts for humanitarian leadership, ensure that child protection is recognized as a life-saving priority and is adequately funded across all sectors. For donors, provide equitable and quality funding, including multi-year funding, to support and scale up effective child protection programs. And for humanitarian organizations, advocate for child protection, mobilize new funding resources, and ensure that children's needs and vulnerabilities are systematically considered in all programs. This report is an interagency resource. It's for you. We encourage you to use it in your internal and external advocacy and broad influencing efforts. We will share it with you after this event. Thank you for attending today. I hope you found this insightful and useful. Once again, uh, a big applause for our panelists and to the amazing Alliance team and others who've joined us today. And a special thanks to Elspeth Chapman and Alison Wright for bringing this all together. Thank you very much. And I wish you a good rest of your day. Bye. Now. Perfect. And don't forget to click on the link that is now put in the chat that is giving you access to the report itself and it will continue being available on the Alliance website. Thank you, everyone.